So that takes me to your revelation around low dose leucine, which <laughs> yes. is also fascinating. So can you talk about that? Sure. So when we were, you know, at some uh, cellular medicine conferences where it's more biochemistry type heavy, looking at the recent literature and some of the literature that was coming out was very interesting on low doses of leucine. Now, leucine is typically uh, thought of as something that activates mTOR as it, as it does. It's thought about uh, for protein synthesis. And usually about two and a half grams of leucine will stimulate protein synthesis and activate mTOR. But there were some cool studies showing that at low doses of leucine, it was doing something else and not activating mTOR. And it was actually decreasing the amount of NAD needed to activate sirtuins, which is very interesting because you know, those are a lot of the metabolic and a lot of the exercise type pathways that we pay attention to. So two ones get, you know, a lot of buzz, NAD gets a lot of buzz, but not, not for what we're talking about here. Um, you know, NAD gets thought of as like this youth molecule, but the way we're looking at it is the way it's kind of transferring energy. And so two ones are thought of as this longevity gene, but the way that we are looking at it is what are the downstream effects of, of activating these sirtuins? And so what they found is that these low doses of leucine can decrease the amount of NAD that you need to activate sirtuins, which is what stimulates the activation of PGC1-alpha that has to do with fat oxidation and mitochondrial function and the upregulation of antioxidant enzymes, everything that we talked about earlier. And so a lot of the studies started uh, utilizing low doses of leucine with other co-activating compounds. So other things that stimulated that same pathway that had an effect on sirtuins or NAD. And there were some pharmaceutical companies looking at it with things like Viagra, Sildenafil, with other things like low doses of resveratrol, low doses of B6. And so there was some really uh, interesting work being done there with some, some human trials. And we saw decreases in triglycerides and a number of different things. But what we were so excited about was this is the same uh, exercise mimetic pathway that we were always trying to stimulate. And so when we were looking at patients taking peptides or GLP-1s, you know, all those studies were done with exercise as well. And so we thought if we can come up with compounds or other things that mimic these same pathways, it would be super beneficial. And so some of our partners in the pharmacy network were compounding low doses of leucine with small amounts of these other co-activating factors. And a lot of the physicians just reported back, you know, tremendous results. You know, a lot of the physicians will, um, they'll only prescribe GLP ones with things like loose energy that has low doses of leucine with other co-activating compounds. It's just a very simple thing that you can do understanding, understanding a little, just a little bit about what low doses of leucine is doing to add to therapies to really further enhance, further enhance therapies. And so loose energy is probably one of the number one selling supplements that we have because most physicians are prescribing it with their GLP ones. So interesting, interesting work being, being done there, but I've always been fascinated by the improvement in NAD efficiency, not necessarily by giving NAD precursors, but there are all these other things that we can do to enhance our own endogenous utilization of, of NAD and low doses of leucine is, is pretty interesting part of that. I love that. It almost is like a hormetic kind of pathway where you're getting the body, you know, you're giving the body a little bit of something. I mean, I guess kind of hermetic would be more of a stressor, but like you're giving the body a little bit of something and it's stoking the pathways to, to go. And yeah. that, that's so cool because, and I remember when NAD came on the scene several years ago and it just was like, again, that more is better kind of, of attitude. I never bought into that necessarily yeah. taking yeah, and, high and, doses and it, of it. Yeah. You know, we, we were all thinking about it, right? We, we understood what NED was doing. It was doing some pretty amazing things. We can look at the pathways, but like you said, they were thinking more is, is better. And even with resveratrol, resveratrol has gotten like a really bad rap recently, but I don't know why it recently came out. We knew that resveratrol was an activating CERT one, right? And we knew that very high doses of resveratrol can be actually pretty damaging to the mitochondria. But even back in 2012, we saw studies showing that when you combine resveratrol with low doses of leucine, it does activate sirtuins, right? Because it's decreasing that what's called KM, the substrate needed to activate sirtuins. And so it's just about finding the right dose and the right, the, the right mixture and, and utilizing, you know, small doses that more isn't always, always better. Perfect example is a study that they did with low doses of leucine and nicotinic acid. So nicotinic acid or niacin has been shown to be great in reducing cholesterol. It's antithrombotic, anti-inflammatory, but people can't handle a lot of the nicotinic acid or niacin because there's insulin resistance, there's nausea, there's a bunch of things going on. But they had this study with low doses of leucine and nicotinic acid, and they can actually found they can decrease the amount of nicotinic acid by 95% 
when in combination with low doses of uh, leucine. So typically you'd give uh, nicotinic acid in like one to two grams. They found that at a human equivalent of 75 milligrams, they can get the same therapeutic outcome when combined with low doses of leucine. Wow. So yeah, simple little things like that where you don't have to have the highest dose ever are just really interesting things. And of course, what you see in a preclinical model and what you see biochemistry wise isn't always going to work, but this is, you know, luckily as pharmacists, we're one-on-one -on -one with physicians all day long and we get to see, is this stuff actually working or not? And we've just gotten so much great feedback and, you know, physicians showing us cholesterol levels and showing us that everything that's been beneficial for the patients, you know, leveraging some of these supplements. I love it. Well, cause these are supplements working in conjunction instead of the supplement sort of vibe right now, which is, oh, let's take nature's Ozempic. Let's take these things that are going <laughs> to stoke GLP-1 or take these things that are going to, you know, they're not mimicking them. They're trying to get the L cells to pump out more GLP-1, but sometimes the L cells are pooped out. Sometimes people have leaky gut or atrophy in their gut lining, or they've got, you know, inflammatory bowel disease or even IBS for longstanding. And those L cells are not necessarily going to do a whole heck of a lot when you throw some berberine at them. So taking advantage of some of these other pathways to use synergistically and adjunctively along with your GLP-1s, I think is such a cool, yeah, you guys are doing some cool stuff.